I am glad you are here. This is a great, grand celebration. This is the Christian Super Bowl. This is Easter. This is where you pull out all the chairs and make everybody have space because something has happened that is worth celebrating to the ends of the earth. It's a big deal. Uh, But also, I don't know if you think about this often, but also Easter is right in the middle of the story. It's not the beginning of the story. It's not the end of the story. Easter is the middle of the story. And so if you don't understand the beginning and the end, oftentimes you don't really feel like celebrating Easter because you don't get it. I don't know if you've ever walked into the middle of a movie, uh, but there's some awkwardness in that moment. Uh, I, I personally was once kicked out of a Harry Potter movie marathon because I walked in without knowing the story in the middle and had a bunch of questions. And those people, uh, those wizard people, they didn't want to answer my questions. So I see the old guy with the beard and I'm like, is that Gandalf? Like, I thought this was Lord of the Rings. And they're like, that's not Gandalf, that's Dumbledore. And I'm like, who's Dumbledore? Is that Harry's grandpa? And they're like, no, he's the guy that runs Hogwarts. And I'm like, what's Hogwarts? And they're like, Josh, get out of here. Like, we do not want to be your friend anymore. Um, And later I read Harry Potter and I understood why they were so mad at me. But if you move into the middle of the story, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so some of you might feel that way coming into Easter. You go, I've heard about Jesus, but I I don't really know the story. I don't get all that. But listen, I'm here for this day and we'll kind of see what happens. And others of you walk in and you like have a study Bible and a Jesus tattoo. And you're like, I wonder what angle they're going to take on the resurrection today. (laughs) So you're like from all different backgrounds. And I get that. I get that. But this is the middle of the story. And so I think it is fair for us to say, uh, can can we tell you the whole story? Because listen, the Bible is one massive story, massive, beautiful story that you should be very much drawn into because it is a story about God and it is a story about you. And you and I, we are story people. We love story. Just look around in our culture. Uh, Video games now are stories of an adventure that you and your friends can go on to accomplish something. Commercials are stories. You're watching some commercial and you're like emotionally invested in this commercial and you're crying and at the end it said Budweiser. And you're like, how is that a Budweiser commercial? And then the next commercial you're crying and it's like Doritos. And you're like, Doritos <laughs> bring world peace? Come on. Uh, but, but there's something about story that we are drawn into. And I submit to you, that's because you were created by a storyteller. And you were, you were created to be drawn into the story, not just the story of your life, but actually the story of the whole world. The Bible is not just God's story, uh, as theologian N.T. Wright says, it is the story of the whole world. And the Bible is not just ink on a page that should be looked at as an old history book. It is rather a living, active story that you and I are invited into. And so today we're going to try something. We're going to try to tell you the whole story, the one whole story in six different acts. One story in six acts. And if this story were to have a title, it would be this. The extraordinary story of how Jesus created and restores everything. The extraordinary story of how Jesus created and restores everything. And so one story in six acts. Here we go. If you didn't know the Bible coming in, you're going to leave and you're going to be able to win a quiz at lunch like you were going to know the Bible. Six acts. Here we go. Act one is beginnings. First act of the Bible is beginnings. Every story has a beginning. And I don't don't know if you've opened to page one, line one of the Bible, but I have good news. Page one, line one of the Bible doesn't say, thou shalt not. It doesn't say, you better not. It doesn't say, I've been watching you and you're bad. It doesn't say I'm making a list and checking it twice. It doesn't say quit doing that. It doesn't say you don't add up. Page one, line one, says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you were to understand that that's the English translation, which is a good translation, but in the Hebrew language, if you were to open the Bible to page one, line one, you would see three words. The first three words in the whole story are these words, Elohim, Barah, Raseth. Elohim, bara, racy. Elohim means God. Bara means created. Racy means everything. It could literally translate to God created and it began. God created and it story got started. The beginnings were created. In the first three words of the story, you are introduced to a character who is capable of speaking worlds into being. 
He speaks planets and stars and sun and moon and galaxies and, and land and water and everything that has been created. He speaks it into creation from his own imagination. There is no point of reference that this God is speaking things into creation from. He simply speaks them and they come into being by obeying the word of his mouth. And in five days, he creates all these things. And on day six, God creates man and he puts him in a garden. And he tells him, take care of the garden, be responsible for the garden. And right away in the story, in a world that is all good, God sees something that isn't good. And the thing that isn't good is that man is alone. It is not good for man to be alone. And if you are a single guy living by himself, listen to the word of God. You're going to get weird if you live alone for too long. Trust me. I know a guy. We're not friends anymore. It's not good for man to be alone. And so God looks for a suitable helper for Adam and he creates animals and he parades the animals in front of Adam and Adam names all the animals. And at the end of this massive event of naming all the animals, God says, none of these are suitable for you. And Adam's like, yeah, obviously. And so God puts Adam to sleep and out of his rib, he creates Eve. And he brings Eve to Adam and Adam sees Eve and he, he bursts out and he says, at last, it's a great first word. At last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. All of a sudden, Adam's a poet. He's like writing poetry for this girl. And God's like, you're gonna get her, man. Like, she's the only one here. Like, <laughs> she's yours. Relax. He's trying to woo this woman. And humans are set apart from the animals and they are set apart from nature. They are set apart by one very specific beautiful thing, that humans are created in the image of of God, that Elohim, the creator God, is in them and printed on them, that inside of them is the creator God's connectedness to them. So they are mirrors of him in their work. We mirror God in our creativity, our relationships, all the things in our lives. We are connected to the creator God. And at the beginning of the story, the creator God and his created people walk together in unhindered intimacy. The Bible says they walk together through the garden in the cool of the day and they are naked and unashamed. Adam and Eve have on no clothes and they are not ashamed. This is representative of a world where there's no guilt, no shame, no trouble, no problems, no sorrow, no hurt. The Garden of Eden, all things are right, all things are beautiful and Jesus created this and he put them in this place so that they would have this perfection and this union with God. But it doesn't take long in the story, like three chapters into the story, we are, we are introduced to another character. And this character is the villain of the story, the snake, the liar, the deceiver, the enemy, and his name is Satan. And he ushers us into act two of the story, which is revolt. And in act two of the story, the snake has Adam and Eve in front of this one tree, and God told Adam and Eve, you can have every tree in the garden, you can go and explore, and everything is good, and everything is yours, but there's this one tree. Stay away from that one tree. Don't eat of that one tree. It's going to go bad for you. It's going to go bad for everything. And the snake comes and takes Adam and Eve to the one tree, which kind of makes you think, like, why are you at this one tree? Like, there's a lot of other things to explore. Get out of here. But the snake takes him to the one tree, and he starts accusing God of being harmful. And he says to Adam and Eve, surely God didn't say you couldn't eat of this tree. God must be withholding from you. God must not have your good in mind. You know what, Adam and Eve? Uh, God doesn't want you to eat of this tree because if you eat of this tree, then God knows you're gonna be like him and God doesn't like competition. And he sells Adam and Eve on a lie that the creator, glorious, good, holy, wonderful, wise God is withholding from them. And they take the fruit and they eat it and in an instant, in an instant, the perfect created world is broken to its core by one disobedient act. Perfect created world, unhindered intimacy with God is broken to its core by one disobedient act. And this is called sin. And listen, I don't know what you've heard about sin, but here's what sin is. Sin is not that we do bad things. Sin is that we do our own thing. Sin is not, uh, God, I, I'm going to do some bad stuff. Sin is what happens when we look at God and say, God, I want my way, not your way. And when the created ones say to the creator, we're going to do it our way, not your way, that's not a fall. That's a revolt. 
because a revolt is an attempt to put an end to someone else's authority. And in an instant, the crown jewel of God's creation traded that crown for a curse. When they said, I'll do it my way, not your way, God. In Psalm 14, verse 3, it says, all have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. In a moment, sin enters the world through one man named Adam. And because of one man's sin, sin is now running through every man, every woman, every child. The whole world is broken. And here is our condition. This is the condition we find ourselves in. That we were born and created in the image of God, but also born into sin. And that creates a tension in our heart. We were simultaneously born desiring to know this God and born desiring to be our own God. This is the human heart's condition. We want God and we want nothing to do with God. We simultaneously walk this earth saying the internal turmoil I feel is God, I want you and God, I wanna be you. I see this in my kids, man. They'll come to me and they'll say, dad, help me. And I go to help them and they're like, dad, leave me alone. I'll do it by myself. Actually, dad, help me. No, I'll do it by myself. Actually, I need your help. Actually, don't touch me. Actually, this is my thing. Actually, dad, I don't even wanna have you. You're like, the fall of man right here in my children. And so what happens in this state is that when you hear this message, you are both simultaneously attracted and offended. When you hear the story, hey, hey, here's the story. There's a God and you have sinned against that God and that created a distance in your relationship. When you hear someone say that, you are immediately offended by that. You go, whoa, 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 whoa. Who says there's a creator? What about all these theories of other ways the world came about? Why am I a sinner? That's what's wrong with the church. All you judgmental people calling me a sinner, you don't know me, man. I'm a good person. So you're offended by this story. And then if you're quiet and honest enough, maybe later on in the day, something inside of you goes, man, maybe maybe I am a sinner. Maybe we're all sinners. Maybe there is a creator and something inside of you is attracted to the story. Though when you hear the story, you're, you're ultimately offended by the story. And that is the dance we find ourselves in as we move into Act 3. Beginnings, revolt, Act 3 is people. The people in revolt start making babies and populating the planet and immediately we have a huge mess. Everyone is doing what they think is right in their own eyes. People are running around multiplying their race and there is an explosion of humanity and no one understands the way. And here's here's the deal. When the created people are revolting against their creator God, This is a recipe for disaster, despair, depression, hurt, pain, fear, hopelessness, terrorism, gun violence, abuse of power, crooked leadership. Everywhere in the world you look, you do not see peace because the creative people are revolting from the creator God. And I believe I do not have to plead with you to get you to believe this point. You look around and you know the world is broken. You know it, you feel it. If you have any eyes to see the world, you know that it is broken. But here's the truth. The world is broken and no matter how much we try, things are gonna stay broken. Because the problem is not that our government is broken and the problem is not that laws are broken. The problem is that the human heart is broken. We are broken to our core. The creative people are revolting from their creator God and our core is off and God knows this about us so he is pursuing us, trying to bring us back into unhindered intimacy but we are running the other way, doing our own thing, saying God I would rather do it my way, living in revolt, living in sin and that's the story. And in the Old Testament, the way God was going to restore and redeem all of the lost people was to create one group of people called the Israelites. And through one group of people, he was going to reach all people. But the difficulty is even the group of people he drew to himself, the Israelites, they run from him and they pursue other things and he chases them down. And you enter the dark cycle of Act 3. That they run away and he pursues them and they come back and they run away and he pursues them and they come back and they run away and he pursues them. And the dark cycle of act three is this. You see the story of the unfaithfulness of a people towards a God who is never once unfaithful to them. The unfaithfulness of a people towards a God who is never once unfaithful to them. Because act three reveals in us the turmoil of the human heart. 
that not only are our hearts broken, but like I said before, our hearts understand something because they were made in the image of God. Our hearts are not just broken. They are burning for an answer to the problem. (laughs) They know there's a problem and they're wondering, is there someone who can answer this problem? We are broken from sin, but we are burning for a savior because the image of God is on us. Now, some of you in the room are better at, at squilching that burning sensation than others, but the reality is if you think hard enough about it, there is a desire in you wondering, can someone fix this mess? Is a hero going to come? And that's the tension of the story. There's tremendous tension in Act 3 because all throughout the Old Testament, these people were burning for a Savior and there was a promise of a Savior who was going to come, but he hadn't come yet and there was no way the world was gonna be fixed unless this Savior came. And so people start to wonder to themselves, maybe the revolt is the new standard of the world. Maybe sin is going to win. Maybe there is no way out of this thing. Maybe we're always gonna be hopeless and broken and in despair. Maybe no one can do anything about the state we're in because Lord knows we've tried and it's not working. And in the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament is the book of Malachi. And from Malachi to the first book of the New Testament, which is the book of Matthew, you have 400 years of silence. From the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew, 400 years of longing. And generation after generation going, is someone going to come and fix this thing? Generation after generation, silence upon silence upon silence. And that's the tension of the story. But finally, the silence is broken. And through the generations of silence, we move into Act 4 with an angelic pronouncement. The heavens part and an angel goes to a teenage girl. How awesome is that? A teenage girl is going to turn this thing around. Goes to a teenage girl and says, I bring you good news of great joy. Do not be afraid anymore. And tells this teenage girl, you are going to have a son and his name is going to be Jesus and he's going to be Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Elohim is going to be with us. The God who walked with us in the cool of the garden is going to enter into the story and walk with us again. You're going to have a son. It's almost as if the creator of the story is saying the only way this mess can be made right is if I step into the mess myself and make it right. And so Jesus is born of a virgin, fulfilling a prophecy of the Old Testament. And then Jesus is inside of Mary's womb and Mary has a cousin named Elizabeth and Mary goes to her cousin named Elizabeth and Elizabeth is pregnant with a son named John who later is like John the Baptist who's a major part of the story. And John the Baptist is in Elizabeth's womb and Jesus is in Mary's womb and when they get close to each other, John the Baptist starts doing cartwheels in his mom's womb. True story. You got pre-birth celebration happening for the one who has come to break the silence. Pre-birth celebration, John is stoked and he's not even born yet. He's like, oh, it's about to go down. Get me out of here. Let's do this. Jesus is eight days old and they take him to the temple, as was the custom. And this crazy old man in the temple named Simeon grabs eight-day-old Jesus and starts dancing around the temple with him like a crazy person because some religious people are crazy. It's awesome. So imagine like the weirdest guy in the church just takes the baby and starts going all over the place dancing. And he says this, he says, at last my eyes have seen the salvation of the Lord that you have promised. Now I can die in peace because I've seen the salvation you prepared for all people. So you have pre-born John the Baptist celebrating, crazy Simeon dancing around the temple going, it's finally here, now I can die. You're like, okay, this story's getting interesting. Then you fast forward to Jesus being 12 years old. He's in the temple again and his family leaves him there because they traveled in big groups. His parents were cool, but they left him and, and he, they go back to get him and he's teaching the religious leaders at 12 years old. And then when his mom says, Jesus, what are you doing here? Jesus says, didn't you know I would be in my father's house? So you got a 12 year old boy saying, God, Elohim, he is my father. Then you fast forward to when Jesus is 30 years old, he goes to the Jordan River to get baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. Pre-birth celebration, John the Baptist is baptizing people and Jesus shows up and John looks at everybody there and says, to, points at Jesus and says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And to that group of people listening, they knew that lambs were killed in the Old Testament to take away sin. And John the Baptist just goes, oh, the once and for all lamb is here. 
And everybody's like, whoa, that's the like pre-birth celebration, crazy Simeon, 12 year, yeah, that guy, yeah, he's here. And then Jesus is at a wedding. And at the wedding, they run out of wine and his mom says, hey, we need more wine. And Jesus is like, I'm not sure it's my time yet. And mom's like, well, you better hurry up then, man, because we need more wine. And the first miracle, true story, Jesus turns water to wine at a wedding, almost as if to say, God is going, hey, let, let, let's turn this thing up. It's about to get real. <laughs> the first miracle, Jesus turns water into wine. And then he recruits 12 guys and they travel around from town to town and they're teaching and they're healing. And he says crazy things, like things no one in the world has ever seen or heard before. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And he goes and he says, the thief has come only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. He tells people, I am the resurrection and I am the life, and he who believes in me will live even though he dies. He tells people, I am the bread of life. If you come and you eat from me, you'll never be hungry again. I am living water. If you drink from me, you'll never be thirsty again. John uh, records him saying that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody gets to the Father except by me. And he has power in his words and healing in his hands and demons run from him, diseases run from him. This might be the guy. And there is a wrestling in the people and they are following him and they're thinking maybe this is the savior. Maybe the silence is over. And at the same time, Jesus is creating a following. He's also creating people that hate him. And the religious leaders in the Roman world, they start to accuse Jesus of, of wanting to lead a revolt. And so all of the anticipation, all of the buildup finds its way to Jerusalem in one week called Holy Week. And on Thursday of that week, they finally find one of the disciples to betray Jesus and to give him over. And this great story, this huge buildup, all that's been happening here, all of the wrestling, all of the buildup, leads to a Thursday night when Jesus is betrayed and he is accused. And so the night of Thursday, he takes his disciples to a room and he washes their feet. And they have a meal together and he hands them bread and he says, take this bread and remember my body that's gonna be broken on your behalf. Take this wine and remember the fact that my blood is gonna be spilled in your place and remember me. And then Jesus takes his three best friends and he goes to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And what happens in the story all led to a garden. And the same story finds itself in another garden. He's praying in a garden. And the whole issue of sin and revolt all started in a garden. One man's disobedient act in a garden led sin to reign in the world. And now one man's obedient act in a garden is going to rid this world of sin. It is an incredible story that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, God, I'm willing to go to the cross. And what happens is the, the soldiers come and they arrest him and they ultimately crucify him. And why this takes the world by storm and why this is so crazy for the world is that the world expected Jesus, this great savior, to be a warrior king, a mighty fighter, but instead he is one who lays down his life for the people. He doesn't come to the world to give us an exercise we need to do to get to God. He comes to the world to be an exchange for us. An exercise says if you do this stuff, then God will forgive you. An exchange says you can't do it, I'll do it in your place and I'll get what you deserve. So the crescendo of the story is the innocent one will become the guilty one so the guilty ones can become the innocent ones. The crescendo of the story is not that he would fight and become a warrior king. The crescendo of the story is that he would give himself in our place. And so they take him and they crucify him. And everybody in the Roman world and all the religious leaders thought, we can put an end to Jesus by killing him. And the reason Easter is the Super Bowl and the reason there is so much celebration and the reason this thing is crazy is because when Jesus was crucified and put in the tomb, everyone in the world thought that was the end of the story. We've done away with this crazy zealot named Jesus. But in the most miraculous event in human history, the only resurrection 
that, that you see in any world religion is the story of Jesus coming back from the dead, justifying every one of the teachings he had proclaimed. He was who he says he was. The curse could be broken. The revolt could be exchanged for restoration, for redemption. Life is on the table for the whole world. And then he looks at his followers and he says, go and tell the world. This is a huge deal. This is not something we yawn about and go, oh, this is no big deal. I'll just carry on with my life and my career and my family. Oh yeah, Jesus rose from the dead, that's cool. No, 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 this message becomes the message. There is no other message. So you go, man, Josh, isn't this the end of the story? Like, what could come after Act 4? Act 4 is Savior. Shouldn't we just end the story right there? No, 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 no. This is where the story picks up and ushers us into Act 5 called the church. And the church is now a group of people that God has redeemed, people that believe in the resurrection of Christ. It's just like in the Old Testament where God took one people to reach all people. Now it's anyone who believes in Jesus. You are a part of the people that go and to reach all people. This is the story. We have been made into a family as the church. We have been sent on a mission. The church is the mechanism by which the story of the resurrected Savior is going to the ends of the earth. There is no plan B. The story is on us right now. So if you're checking out Resonate and you're going, hey, what is this church about? Well, well, let me tell you, we're about what every church should be about, which is making sure the story of the resurrected Savior makes its way to the ends of the earth. Do you have some programs here? Yeah, kind of, but who cares? We're trying to make sure the story of the resurrected Savior gets to the ends of the earth. Well, tell me about what your, your theological views on career. Go work wherever you want, but make sure the story of the resurrected Savior gets to the ends of the earth. Are you guys going to care for me? Yeah, as we're running to the ends of the earth. You get, I'm yelling. Do you get the point? <laughs> you, you think I'm passionate about it. This has to get there. It has to. What's the point of the church? Well, the point of the church is to be the people that tell all the people about the one who made life available to the ends of the earth. This is the story. And the fascinating plot twist is that the ones whose hearts were broken longing for a savior are now the ones whose hearts are broken longing for the world to see their savior. The fascinating plot twist is the ones who used to be the enemies of God have seen the resurrection and have their hearts changed, and now they are the, van, the evangelists for God. This is the great exchange. And this means anybody from any background, any story, however you wanna come, you come just as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up to make this thing right. You come just as you are, and the church welcomes you into a family on mission. And where we find ourselves this morning is right smack dab in the middle of Act 5. We are in the act, the church act. We are in the middle of act five. And act five is so significant because the decisions we make in act five determine where we spend act six. Act one, beginnings. Act two, revolt. Act three, people. Act four, savior. Act five, church. Act six, forever. God's story is an eternal story. It's a forever story. And believe it or not, this story actually ends where it began. If you read the last chapter in the Bible, Revelation 21, it says this in verse three, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and he will be their God. I don't know if you caught that, but that's the same terminology they used at the Garden of Eden. That what began in the Garden of Eden was absolutely ruined by one man's disobedience and what was restored in the Garden of Gethsemane by one man's act of obedience and his resurrection from the dead after the cross has now made the union with God that we most long for available again. So this story arc is going back to where it started in the first place and from the beginning of the story to the end of the story, we find ourselves right in the middle of the story and the center of this story is the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is the centerpiece of this story because I submit to you it is the centerpiece of the whole world. That the Christ who was crucified in the place of sinners 
is now raised triumphant over the devil and sin and death and hell. Jesus is the one, and this is an extraordinary story of how Jesus is the one who created and restores everything. And why is this story so significant? Why is this story worth your life? And why is this story worth recruiting you to tell the ends of the earth? Here's why. Because every other world religion tells you a story of what you have to do to get to God. And Christianity is a story that tells you what God did to get to you. Every other world religion says, do all this stuff to get to God. Christianity says, here's all the stuff God did to get to you. Every other story of of rescue says, you go out there and you sacrifice yourself for God and that'll make God pleased. Christianity is the story of God who sacrificed himself for you in your place. So this message should offend you and it should attract you because the story being told out there in the world is a soft underselling of the story that probably says something like this. God just wants you to be happy. You do whatever you want And as long as at the end of the day you do enough good to outweigh your bad, then you'll be fine because at the end of the day, God just wants you to be happy and there's lots of different ways to get to God. So whatever you want to do, you're the own authority. You do it your own way, which sounds sneakily suspicious like what the enemy told Adam and Eve. You do it your own way. But the biblical story says that you are an enemy of God. Because of your revolt, you are no longer in unhindered intimacy with him. And you are dead in your sin and in your present state of rebellion, you're not even able to see the needs you have, much less cause yourself to come to life. Therefore, you are radically dependent on God to do something in your life you could never do. And praise God, you have one who has done something in your place that you were unable to do. So this is offensive and this is attractive and this should turn your heart on fire, that you are a sinner bad news, but there is a savior, good news, and he has overcome everything imaginable to save you. So you should run to him. You should trust him. You should believe in him and be saved by him. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. It doesn't matter how bad it is. How can I say that confidently? Because I know where Jesus has been, and I know what Jesus has done, and I know he overcame the grave to save you. That means whatever part of your life and whatever part of your story feels dead and feels broken, great news. There is one who specializes in raising the dead and healing the broken. Josh, you don't know my story. You don't know what I've gone through. I know his story and I know what he went through. So you come to him just as you are. And you can be radically forgiven because he has authority in his words and power in his, in his being. And he has come back from the dead to save you. Do not stay in the crazy cycle of Act 3 when the glorious truth of Act 6 is available to you. A union with your creator God made possible by the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. This is absolutely worth celebrating. In the children's story, Chronicles of Narnia, the Jesus character is a lion named Aslan and the Satan character is a a white witch At the final scene of of the first movie, Aslan is killed, and the White Witch has all of these people, prisoners in her castle, and they've been made into frozen statues. And when Aslan, the Jesus character, rises from the dead, the very first thing he does is he runs to the White Witch's castle, where all of the people are frozen like statues. And he goes to them one by one, and he breathes on them. And when Aslan the lion breathes on the statues. Their hearts are melted and they come back to life. And one by one by one, these people come back to life and they run from the castle and they join Aslan in the mission of making sure everyone in the world hears the message of the one who can turn statues into life. The one who can turn frozen hearts into life. And we believe that that story is a metaphor of what's happening right now in this room. As some of us come in this room frozen like statues and Jesus comes to us individually, one by one, one at a time and gets face to face with us and he speaks over us life. And when you hear that life and you trust that life, something inside of you resurrects from the dead because of the spoken word over your life. 
And that is the beautiful power story, powerful story of Easter. But it's only beautiful and powerful if you receive that invitation. Because the Easter story is not a story of human achievement. The Easter story is a story of divine accomplishment. You achieved nothing. He accomplished everything. And he offers that to you today. So we plead with you. We plead with you. If your heart is burning, come out of revolt into redemption. Trust in Christ. Don't resist any longer. He has lived the life you couldn't live. He has died in your place. He has resurrected from the dead, divinely accomplishing everything necessary for unhindered intimacy with God, and he offers it to you today. And all you have to do is believe. And so if you feel your heart burning, that is Jesus saying, believe. I've created you in my image. I want unhindered intimacy with you. Believe. Believe. Trust me. Aren't you tired of doing this on your own? Trust me. Be recruited into that crazy church where that guy yells about the ends of the earth like, trust me, this is good. Trust me. Trust him today. And then tomorrow and then the next day so that you can spend act six with him forever in unhindered intimacy with your creator.